Just a word to our Prime Minister. I'm not the king, the dean, the devil, someone with a digestive tract problem. If you don't want to heed to the word of God, you might have a friend coming to Ottawa and knock on your door. I blow the wind of God. The wind of God. On you. I'm just getting into a prophetic vein. Mama Moko Solo the Basata. I don't make this stuff up. I know we shouldn't have to scream that we're atheists. You know, we don't have non astrologers and all that. Stop but waiting for not them not to bring God back to Parliament. I mean, we we'll do it. I'm proud of being an atheist, a skeptic, a non believer, an infidel, a heathen. I call it how I see it. I say it's ignorance and you just call it faith and unsubstantial. Coming at you from Work Beach here in Noah Bursar, Florida, this is Left of the Valley 2.0. My name is Kevin, I and I accidentally used the dog shampoo today, but I'm feeling such a good boy. <laughs> Who's a good boy? I'll give him a treat later. <laughs> going to be as usual as the team who have the, uh, the Energizer Bunny arrested and charged with battery. <laughs> 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 Guys, welcome back. <laughs> Had a great time and a great week. And this show is brought to you by our patrons. You too can go to patreon.com slash LETV and you too can help Brett Lee stop using an alligator as a ventriloquist dummy. Go to patreon.com you know? And they're all over the place down here. It's, you know. That's you what we use for pets. currency down here. I like to say the alligator would bite less if you if you put your hands somewhere else. So, so. <laughs> yeah, they don't tend to like it very much. Though. No, no, they don't. What are you going to do? Today, guys, we'll be talking to Dr. Jeff Ray in the second half of the show. We'll be doing a more deeper dive into the incel phenomenon. But first, let's do our usual tip chat. All right. Perfect. And, um, all right, guys. Well, I hope you had a great week before I get into all this. Oh, yeah. No, maybe. Oh, <laughs> you guys want to quite all <laughs> I'll go with the rhetorical great. And you? I was fantastic, Kevin. How is he? <laughs> I had highs and lows this week. So oh, I, well. I'm in a good neutral neutral playing field right now. Excellent. Neutra- oh. I'm in neutrality right now. <laughs> <laughs> in the going deeper news, um, guys, you might not know, but during the Cold War, you know, there was lots of races between the West and the Soviet Union, you know, like the moon landing, for example. You know, we all know about that one. The one that you might not know of is that there was some other races, and one of them was which one could drill through the Earth crust first, whether the West or the Soviet Union could drill through the crust of the Earth. That, that was a race. That was an actual race between the, the superpowers. And it, served by the, it was started by the U.S. in the 60s. Now, the U.S. started drilling into the Pacific uh, Ocean uh, near Mexico. It was called uh, Project Mohol, which became a flop because, you know, they mismanaged and financial issues. They had to give it up. But the Russians drill what became known as the Kola Superdeep Borehole. Now, the borehole itself was actually made up of numerous holes which branch off from a central hole, the deepest of which is called SG-3. And it runs about 12,263 meters. For American friends, that's 40,230 feet deep into the Earth's crust. Hmm. And despite like, these... Uh, sorry? It's like the uh, Atlantis one. SG Atlantis was pretty good. <laughs> but, you know... <laughs> Well, despite these mighty de- these uh, mighty depth, however, the diameter of the hole is actually no wider than a dinner plate. So it's you know, it's it's, it's they basically just drilled and drilled and drilled. Now, for your perspective, it's like a here, cold war for meerkats. It's just dig a tunnel. You know? Yeah, <laughs> you don't want Timmy falling into that well. Trust me. Uh, okay. <laughs> the whole depth is about about the height of Mount Everest and Mount Fuji, placed on top of one another. Just to give you an idea, it's also deeper than the deepest point of the ocean, which is the Mariana Trench which lies at a depth of 11,034 meters or 36,201 feet below sea level. Now, drilling began in May 20, uh, May 24, 1970, and continued to 1992, shortly after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, it wasn't just a political turmoil and cash shortage that brought the ambitious project to an end. Uh, according to the BBC, uh, future drilling reported to stop when temperatures at the bottom of the hole reach a sizzling 180 degrees Celsius or 356 degrees Fahrenheit, which is drastically higher than their model predicted. Now, are, are you sure about that? Because I remember reading on the internet 
that they came across the subterranean lizard men that are ruling the wor- wor- world. It's like it's I'm so, kind of giving you that. Like, if, you can't, have, if you can't Nazis believe QAnon, there. are there <laughs> Nazis that have underground bases that exist down there? That, that's what I heard. Well, ro- robot Hitler has to be hiding out somewhere. So right, so. exactly. In, in 2008, the Russian government announced it would have to destroy the hole, uh, and they've basically done this by now. Uh, sadly, the site now lies abandoned. It's consisting of little more than a dilapidated building and a bolted shutdown pipe in the ground. Um, the hole, however, revealed 1.4 billion years of the Earth's history. You know, you know, big like when they do those those cores, those ice cores, pretty much the same mm-hmm. thing. Really. Uh, most surprisingly, the deep rocks were found to be saturated with water which we assume impossible because the rocks were sealed beneath a layer of impermeable rock. Ah. And they also discovered 14 species of fossilized microorganisms down there, too. Not to mention deposits of gold, copper, and nickel. Now, and this hole was also used by Christian grifters. Of course they were. Because there's fair share of fanciful rumors around the site. Um, One widely spread urban legend said that the drill broke through a layer of rock and discovered a super hot cavern. And to investigate, scientists supposedly lowered a microphone into the pit, only to hear something like the sound like the hellish howls and tormented screams. <laughs> Wait a second, you mean when they recorded hell, that wasn't real? That wasn't <laughs> true? What? I, I thought they were just playing John Lennon backwards. <laughs> I, I remember this, and it's still being pushed today. The fact that you know that super uh, that super deep hole drilled by the Russian discovered hell accidentally. So, of course, the story is totally unverified. (laughs) Um, Well, they figured out what it was, right? It was some type of um, uh, static or something or some type of – it was a malfunction of the the microphone. There there was never a microphone lowered in there. There Oh, there wasn't. They They never did. was. Let's just say they did it. Let's just say they lowered a microphone in and some weird noises came out, like – it's just a pareidolia effect at that point. You know, yeah. it doesn't prove anything. It just says that like, Oh, I heard some weird shit. Well, you know, it, like, first, of all, first of all, you know, by the time you reach that, that, that depth, like we said, the 356 degrees Fahrenheit, your microphone's melting at that point. I don't care. <laughs> right. I mean, exactly. like, you're not recording anything. Your microphone is melted. You'll hear the melting sound of the microphone. That's what you That's hear. That's what it is. That's what That's it is. You hear the melting <laughs> sound of your microphone equipment. Like when they would light stuff on fire, like Ouija boards and shit, and they'd be like, yeah, and you could hear the screams of the demons. You could hear the screams. And it's like, because that's the way, you know, when you burn shit, you're not supposed to fucking burn. It tends to, like, make weird noises. You know? <laughs> what I think is kind of funny is, like, there's nothing new underneath the, uh, beneath the sun in the sense that, like, in, like, ancient myths and stuff, I've been going through a lot of those lately. There's, like, spots throughout Europe where you have, like, these really deep holes or 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 these really deep caves that people don't go into. And it's like, there's a couple gateways to hell that, that uh, <laughs> like, the... Uh, like when I was doing St. Patrick or whatever, it's a uh, uh, when they said like St. Patrick followed the one beast to the gates of hell or whatever. It was it was a case where a literal spot of a big big hole where everybody thought it's like oh yeah if you follow him there you're going to fall straight to hell and it's well, like uh, there's it's like, like, oh, like oh, no, three hundred years going. later or, or six seven hundred years later we're no further advanced. It's like we're still that superstitious. Well, yeah, because yeah. like if you go to like. Greece, where they had um, worship sites, the Hades, it was always by like caves, you know, places that, you know, people would venture into because they thought that was like a way into the underworld, yeah. you know, like it's still the same thing, you know, and it, I mean, like there's cool shit in caves, like, you know, people have done the cave thing and we learn and there's, it's really, really cool, but also at the same time, it's just like, no, everybody's everybody is afraid of what they don't understand, and then they have to make up a narrative to um, justify how they're feeling about it. Because yeah. that's what yeah. we do. So, <laughs> so, so if you ever hear one of this, because this this this, this urban legend still goes around in Christian grifter circles, uh, ever hear about a super deep hole and they f- put a microphone and they heard hell? No, that's all bullshit. <laughs> that is all bullshit. And now you know. Huh. All right. That's in um, something smells fishy news, um, you know there's oh, another. Sorry. Movie... <laughs> <laughs> there's another new treatment that's being trialed in Brazil and with great success, especially on the treatment of burns. Right, um, 
typically in a severe burn case, you know, the wound is clean and they remove all whatever dead skin and they and they, they put some kind of medical gauze, right, mm -hmm. uh, to, to seal it while the long process of skin regeneration takes place. Uh, the bandage is more often needs to be changed often and also often will cause, you know, pain and discomfort, you know, because sometimes it'll, it'll stick and pull and stuff like that. Well, in the last few years in Brazil, uh, skin grafts have been used to facilitate recovery, but not the skin that you think. The Brazilian doctors are now grafting tilapia skin, the fish. The fish is abundant in Brazil, although it originates from so Africa. So, like when you tan, do you add butter instead of lotion now? Or no? <laughs> and oh, Aquaman. Oh, that's, what that, that's how you get Aquaman. Yeah. See, oh, sorry. Just a See, little like, bit of lime. I'm delicious. I have now. a friend when, <laughs> in our teens that she actually would go out and put butter on her body and tan and now her skin all year round is like leather oh yeah <laughs> yep <laughs> was it was it an episode from Seinfeld where kramer was doing that was using butter to tan <laughs> well she was so obsessed with it that her family her mom took away like the baby oil and all the regular tanning stuff so then she's like well you can cook with butter so she started you know, putting butter on herself you know yeah. i don't think that's a life goal to become like roast chicken <laughs> I, I think that's a good life goal going for rotisserie just, what is, just yeah. saying so anyway that fish is pretty abundant in brazil and it's also super cheap uh the, the estimate the cost it will cost about one dollar per patch to, to produce this um, and thanks to its high type one collagen cotton and tensile strength and similar morphology to human skin, tilapia skin makes an ideal piscine plaster. It, quote, prevents the loss of moisture and proteins in, uh, on the wound, and it stays bonded to the bed of the wound until it heals over. Oh. And this is from Dr. Edmar Marcial, one of the study's authors, who told the New York Times last year. And this helps to speed up wound recovery and protect against contamination. Now, by the time you reach day 12 to 17, new skin starts to form, and the tilapia skin has dried out, and it peels away, and with apparently no side effect. So this is pretty cool. So, yeah. And it's used in skin graft. It's not just a one-time or one-species thing. Tilapia skin is also being used right now to treat pediatric burns, and it's even being to help our four-legged friends, apparently it, it, it having aided the healing of a bite wound in a miniature dash hound. <laughs> Yeah. Hot dogs I mean, and fish. No. Yeah, exactly. So we <laughs> <fish> <laughs> just published a study in the Journal of Surgical Case Reports. So That's great awesome. leaves and bound, and they're using fish skin now in Brazil, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> That is cool. Well, and then we're going to see people like become part fish because that's how that works. You get fish skin. <laughs> the, you're you're, 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 you're going to think you're, you're a mermaid. I used to think that the, like the band hooting in the in the glowfish or glowfish or whatever was just a name, but it turns out they just had skin grafts. Well, if you ever seen if you ever seen tilapia skin, it's got that really black and gray scaly thing. It looks like a the Aquaman suit kind of thing. And yeah. It looks yeah. pretty yeah. damn cool, actually. <laughs> so, who knows? And like, you know, like, like it, it is funny because like. When me and my husband will eat seafood, we don't tend to eat tilapia because it's considered like a bottom rung fish. Yeah. You yeah. know, as far as health wise. But now that you're talking about like, well, we can use it for skin grafting. I'm like, huh. <laughs> Huh. Well, look at me being proven wrong that there is some use to tilapia. <laughs> <laughs> hey, honey, pull the frozen fish out of the freezer. I got to burn. No, right. <laughs> yeah. when you go for surgery and the guy is standing above you, it's not your doctor, it's Captain Highliner. You realize, holy shit, <laughs> <laughs> not the crab. God, no, gosh, get the, oh, the fish. <laughs> that was all the crab. Have you ever you had know? a skin graft, Billy? No. <laughs> right. Me using tilapia. <laughs> I, I, like, it is really cool, though. Like, the more. Like, and this is the cool thing about science, y'all. Like, the more we study it and the more we understand, like, genetic components and DNA and the way things work, you know, interspecies-wise, like, there's a lot of really interesting stuff that's happening. Exactly. You know, 
I know. I mean, like, I mean, I would love to pray to the sky daddy and for, you know, wounds to heal, but no, like we have to do this, the hard work and do the science shit. Well, so you, know, you can't just pray the sky da daddy. You got to send in your donation first. No, no. Oh, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. They need 10% of my income to you be healed. Be I forgot about that. You should be praying for Poseidon for more tilapia. Yeah. All right. That's right. I did. Thank, thank you, Titan. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Where were they on? Titan, right, thank you, King Neptune, for tilapia. <laughs> you got a drop there for us, Ellen? <laughs> yes, I do. All right. Top, 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 top 10. So, my top 10 this week, because Dr. Ray is going to be on the show. Mm. Dr. Ray is going to be on the show, and he is my bud. And it wouldn't be proper if we're good, if for Dr. Ray to be on the show and not talk about weird sexual customs from around the world. <laughs> Wait a minute. You need to put this in the context here. You just said it'd be weird to have Dr. Ray on the show and not talk about weird sex. You need to put this in the <laughs> That's it. That's it. Don't, 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 don't explain anything. I'm you not saying Dr. Ray participates. I don't know. I don't know his sex habits. But, <laughs> but, the and we're going to talk about Dr. Ray. Well, we're not having somebody back on as a guest. <laughs> a lot of handcuffs. I don't know. But we're going to have he, Dr. He, Ray he's on. Not gonna I have watch to talk about weird sex stuff. It's just a rule. Listen, okay, them's but, the rules. I don't make them. For people that don't know, Dr. Del Ray is a psychologist that deals with human sexuality. Okay? So, so for people that don't yeah. know. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yes. he, he knows a lot about human sexuality and relationships. That's yes. so, yes. So, but still, I have to be the weird one and talk about weird sex shit. <laughs> that's my brand. I better get comfortable with this. You so, get uncomfortable, people. Yeah. <laughs> so, number one. So, this comes, I forget what I both said. I'm on, I'm on scoophoop.com in the news and weird sexual rituals. I'm sure this is very well For researched. How, how many ads did pop up when you? Uh, when I you actually zero when I <laughs> oh, zero okay. when I put this up. So you know, oh. there we go. So um, we're going to start with number one. And so in the Sambian tribe of New Guinea, have a tradition of separating their boys from the girls at the ages of seven. At the ages of seven for 10 years. During this period, they undergo piercings, nosebleeds, and have to drink semen of the tribe's mightiest war warriors. Ooh. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> this ice cream sucks. <laughs> <laughs> the cannoli. I, I guess it's the idea of like that transfer of energy like if you drink the semen the mightier warriors obviously you will grow up to be a mighty warrior yes because yeah. that's how that works <laughs> that's why uh that's why red bull has turning into in it, so it's, i don't know it, it's can't judge <laughs> it's a bit like okay um uh, this is this is kind of really uncomfortable um it's making me feel weird even to read that read this but um girls of the tribe the rana tribe engage in sexual acts from age six oh so the trobriander tribe of papua new guinea embrace sexuality from an astonish astonishingly young age boys so start engaging like in sexual stuff. activity from the age of 10 to 12 while the girls start from six years jeez so, wow okay. i yeah, that is uncomfortable. I, I don't know how to. Yeah, I don't know no. what to do with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I don't. I mean, what do you mean by sexual activity? How? how I mean. I, don't I think they didn't go into detail. <laughs> I mean, like, no, I right? don't. Yeah. Well, let's bring up a subject that we could get, go get arrested let's discussing. Let's go on. Because I don't. <laughs> you know, the first thing that on. comes through my mind, though, is like child beauty pageants down in the States where it's like for where you'll have like parents stuffing the kids' bras and everything else. And get and, them like they're like, all done you know, up how, in yeah. way that's more sexual. makeup than I, even I wear. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So like that's sexualization and teaching them, teaching them, like grooming them to be like sexual objects and stuff, too. Yeah. So it's like it's, at a very young age. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. It's, so, weird um, and gross. it's all weird. It it's all now. weird and gross. It's very yeah. weird and gross. Indeed. So in yeah. in Manga Mangaia M A M A N G A I A. Okay. Um older women have sex with young boys. So in Mangadia, 
an island of the South Pacific Ocean. Boys around the age of 13 have sex with older women who teach them the intricacies of the act and how to best please their partner. See, I always <laughs> thought cougars were indigenous to North America. <laughs> but it, it is kind of interesting. Like, in that culture is encouraged where now we're we're still having debates if a older woman has sex with a younger boy is it abuse where we would say yes because there's a power structure yes that's involved um but in this culture it's actively encouraged Hmm. well you know it's 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 a teaching lesson at at the same time which is interesting you know uh, you know god knows uh i'm sure these boys are not complaining (laughs) i don't think so well yeah. yeah but like but like okay but then we're gonna reverse it let's say it's an adult man with a 13 year old girl yeah i agree you, you well, know what the discussions we're having <laughs> like, yeah. some cultures, though it's um like in mexico it is their culture that an older man marries a female before the age before the female is the age of 15 because then they can form them to the wife they want them to be Ugh. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's uh, so no weird. grooming there. So weird. Yeah, it's very patriarchal, <laughs> which would make sense for like you know tribes that you know are out there doing their thing. So okay, so, um, we're gonna move on to uh, this one's actually like a little bit more fun. <laughs> it's that it's not helping me go like I don't. Uh, um, so this one is in rural Austria. Women, young women, do a ritual dance with apple slices stuffed in their armpits. After the dance, each gives her slice to the man of her choice, and he then eats it. <laughs> oh, okay, that's well, uh, yeah, kind of okay. Got the kinks. Buddy apple. But <laughs> to be fair, a lot of your pheromones come from your underarms. So yeah, I'm just, I'm just you wondering know. if and women's have a tendency to shave their armpits or not. You, you have to brush off the armpit hair first. Before you <laughs> yeah, you do. Armpits. That's important. Yeah. 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 After the dance, yeah. the guys are like. Oh. Oh, hey, also, yeah. I imagine yeah. you're now using a whole lot of deodorant <laughs> during this can. Ooh, you know, exciting. unless you want your, you know, um, unless you want your armpit apple, this tastes like secret. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, kind of ruins the magic there, you know. <laughs> this one I've actually... Um, that's one I've actually um, heard about in a doc- documentary, and actually, this is kind of um, I'm kind of on I'm on kind of on board with this. The Curing Tribe builds love huts where teenage girls can have sex with different men until they find the right one. So, the Curing Tribe in Cambodia, the others built a love hut for their teenage daughters. Different boys spend the night here day after day until she finds a suitable partner who is then hers for her life. That's kind of cool. Which okay. I kind of, I kind of dig. I dig it. Like, oh, I mean, she's a like there's nothing weird lady. here. It's nothing weird. It's teenagers, which you're exploring your sexuality. That's what happens to teenagers. You know, they're learning um, sexual consent and decency, and how to relate with, to one another, and also and how to communicate those things. Because I imagine there's some sexual education going on. Mm-hmm. You know, and then wow. they, and through that, over time, they learn to pick a partner that they're compatible with not only sexually but i'm sure if it's working out where they're communicating and stuff like that that they can make emotional connections as well so i'm kind of i'm kind of dating it i i don't think i also think it's way better than the idea of that we have here in north america of you know oh no no, no you shouldn't you shouldn't have sex before marriage i i you know and I, I, I hate to be crude about this but you know you really need to test drive the car before it he would, it, it flight, it would really suck to marry a guy and then find out that you are not compatible in the bedroom at all and yeah. that's what you're stuck with for the rest of your life exactly i yeah. wish i hadn't known that with my first marriage <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's why i got yeah. divorced <laughs> that's what happens see yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah Okay, so uh, this is pretty common knowledge. Um, in ancient Greek, men took young boys as lovers. For ancient Greeks, sexual identity didn't depend on gender and preference, but on who was an active penetrator and who was the penetrate. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> the actor role was associated with higher social status. With the passive role, men, youth and femity, or boy love in other wor- world. Which is weird because this is the weird thing about it too is that like they would marry women, you know, like your 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 job as the woman in the relationship 
wasn't for pleasure. You were just supposed to make babies, you know, but actual love was considered, you know, what the Greeks considered love, eros, whatever it was between a man and a boy, a young boy, you know, mm. it, it's very strange. <laughs> yeah, if you, uh, there's actually a, a new podcast out by Bart Ehrman called mm -hmm. Misquoting Jesus. And mm -hmm. he does a whole episode on uh, homosexuality in the Bible with an actual Bible scholar. <gasps> and they, it's yeah. fascinating. But they go into like what the Greek words were that they used uh, to, to translate and whatnot. And it, they're talking about what you're talking about. When they, when they say like, you know, having a, a, you know, it's like you can't have, have any homosexual activity. That's what they're talking about. They're talking about the Greek tradition of men with young boys. Like that's, mm. you know, so... And, and uh, possibly like it's a very you know it's very vague and it's hard to, to nail it down but then that's why we take it to oh there's just any sexual act with a another man is against the bible but that's not actually the case because that wasn't happening back then so they wouldn't right. be against something that wasn't that they would be completely unfamiliar with but anyway so <laughs> it was awesome it's a great episode so um in certain apolytrust brothers share one woman some of the poly drives in the Himalayas practice polyandry. Basically, all the brothers share one woman so that they don't have two male ch children for their limited farmland. Hmm. They, huh. can't, they don't want to have too many children? They're like trying to not have children? Yeah, I guess so. Basically, all the brothers share one woman so that they don't have too many children for their limited farmland. I. That does make sense. No, no. Like, versus, no, like for sustainability? Like, I'm not saying that it's appropriate, but at the same time, though, it's like something that most societies fall and, and like run in trouble with is they they begin to overpopulate. They run short on resources. And then it's uh, people start fighting over who gets what. It's, uh, morally, I'm, I, I don't think I, I'm like Kevin. It's like, I don't think I can agree with that, but I can also see why they might make sense out of this. It's no, no. The, the real reason for this is because these guys are all too cheap to buy her a gift. So they're splitting the cost. <laughs> oh, okay. like, oh, she wants a new dress. I only get 20 But I have to wonder, too, yeah. like what the male yeah. to female ratio is. Like here, there's more, in the United States, there's more women than men in the United States, but like, it might be a commodity issue too, that there, there's a more of a male dominated species. There's more men being born in within the society. So, you know, there's only so much sexual resource. Yeah. You know? I, I, it's going to be something we're going to see uh, the, the become a phenomenon in China because mm -hmm. of the one child policy, which usually favored young boys back then, which now is over, but now we have a surplus of men in China and women essentially chinese women have their pick right <laughs> they, yeah so for them, you know. yeah which yeah. i find really ironic and funny because yes, nature's <laughs> uh nature uh found a way <laughs> <laughs> like ian malcolm said <laughs> so and number eight the wad abbey tribe holds a wife stealing festival every year so in the wad abbey tribe of nigeria and west africa children are married in their infancy Wow. However, at the yearly Jerewol Festival, Wadabi men wear elaborate makeup and costumes and try to uh, covertly steal another's wife. If they go undetected, their union becomes recognized. Wow. So they can trick the woman into being like, no, I'm the other guy. No, that's... Uh, wow. I'm, I'm <laughs> like you're married at infancy. Okay, so you're married at infancy, which... How does that work? Okay. Not tonight, honey. I got a headache and I need a diaper change. Well, yeah. okay. so, like, hold hold was... on. Just because they're married in infancy doesn't mean there's consummation either. It could be just. No, I'm not saying it's consummation. It's but now, decided, but they yeah. have a ritual where you are married, but if someone steals you, <laughs> then okay. that's recognized as a legitimate relationship. I don't understand the Come logic on, there. Ladies. How romantic is it when a guy shows up with a big burlap sack and just yep, puts that's right. and I kidnapped her fair and square. What? <laughs> <laughs> I used a tranquilizer dart, okay? She was running. I shot her fair and square. She's mine. Now, this is mine. I, I claimed it now. Yeah, you're saying to your friends, you're telling the story to your friends. And it's like, oh, you stole her heart? Oh, no, I clubbed her and pulled her, pulled her away by her hair. It's yeah, like Captain <laughs> Caveman over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so number nine, um, public masturbation ceremonies were held in Egypt. 
So oh. in ancient Egypt, they were obsessed with masturbation, apparently. <laughs> they, believed, wow. they believed in the ebb and flow of the Nile was caused by their god of creation's ejaculation. Oh. Awesome. Thus, they would virtually so masturbate the into the one giant money shot. Or like this is <laughs> like I'm kind of like digging this. They would virtually masturbate into the Nile to ensure a wealth of water for crops. During the Egyptian <laughs> festival of God Min, who represent the pharaoh's sexual power, men regularly masturbated in public. Awesome. <laughs> Aren't there like alligators in the Nile? Yes. Like, yes. <laughs> I'm no, sorry. No. You're a brother boy. Open, all of a sudden, <laughs> sure. They're and crocodiles. Hippos. Okay. There's a lot the of things that want yeah, to kill sorry. you. This is, what, this is where you get the two pump chump, right? It's like, oh my God, that crocodile's coming. I better hurry. <laughs> you know what? I just play, I, I've been playing um, Assassin's Creed Origins, and they do this long history tour of ancient Egypt. This was not mentioned <laughs> <laughs> the history. <laughs> of ancient Egypt. Well, that's really out of the game. Secret <laughs> in the game, right? You got to kill the guy who's not masturbating. You know? Right, exactly. <laughs> you have to assassinate that dum dum. <laughs> I have the game on virtual reality. I'd love to see that in there, and you play in that. No, I'm not playing that. <laughs> I would, I would love that it came out of an adult version. Of, like you're getting like this really cool history lesson of like hieroglyphics and how they dress, the, how they built the pyramids, all this stuff. And here's a side note: here's their masturbation ritual. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to take a trip the down by the Nile. <laughs> <laughs> so, number 10. In Indonesia, you can have sex outside of marriage during the pawn celebration. During the celebration of pawn in Indonesia, participants have to spend the night and have intercourse with someone other than their wife or husband. You have to. Oh, wow. It is said that their wishes of good luck will only come true if they have sex with the same person at all seven celebrations throughout the year the same person yeah okay so it's it is said that their home. wishes so where does it go from a ritual to an affair no yeah, so, exactly. okay so there i guess there's other seven celebrations that go on throughout the year you and i you have sex with the person outside of your marriage but it's the same person it's not like rando people so the right? other wife the yeah. other wife or other yeah. husband. Yeah, you're, so you're basically. This is it, it. This is your bus pass. <laughs> it's like a, a wife swap type thing. It's I smell yeah. a TLC series here. <laughs> yeah, but as long as it's the same pool boy, it's okay. You know, <laughs> well, yeah. it's, it's consensual. It's fine as long as everybody's on board and nobody gets yeah. like you know jelly or weird about it. You know, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Like as a poly person. I get yep, it. Exactly. It's a good time. Yeah. It's <laughs> so that was number 10. Uh, um, I'm going to, I I do have to take a bio break. I'll be right back. So. <laughs> All right. That's how it happens, y'all. I'll be right back. Thank you so much, Helen. <laughs> All right, Troy, I guess you're up, my friend. Do you have a uh, true flyer ball of ash? Okay. The, uh, so I'm starting off with a question this time. According to this medieval Jewish myth, who is the first woman created by God? Kabbalah. Yes, Kevin. Ke Kevin's familiar with Lilith. I am familiar with Lilith. So Lilith is like a huge That's subject. <laughs> so it's uh, I, I got to narrow it down to one or two myths, but a little bit of a backstory. I'm familiar uh, with her from Fraser, but that's about it. But go on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so uh, she makes her first appearance uh, in Abrahamic uh, fo uh, folklore, but. Uh, uh, she's arguably the most developed mythological figure throughout history. Like she dates, goes all the way back to 2000 BC, where mm -hmm. she starts off as a yeah, like a supernatural species known as Lili, or and a few other different names. And then she's also depicted as a divine, a divine being, a type of devilish uh, monster, Adam's rebellious first wife, an infant murdering demoness who also causes miscarriages. Um, a being a uh, being of primordial evil, the wife of the anti god Samuel, Satan's concubine, the Jeez. mother of demons. It's a, it's a long list Jeez. here. Um, she's been around. <laughs> yeah, she's been around. She nowadays, okay. yeah, yeah, nowadays, like you'll know Lil from adaptations, like uh, like the succubus is uh, mm -hmm. based off of. It's a variation of the wolf character. Uh, we see comic book characters of her in like DC and Marvel. Um, and it's like we even have like a woman's uh, um, uh, a woman's uh, lib magazine uh, named after her. 
<laughs> so, yeah, but like I said, it's like, it's, uh, so with all these different variations, I can pretty much uh, only really stick to one. Um, there's a few vague mentions of Lilith in the Bible, um, in uh, Isaiah and in uh, Revelations, uh, but she remains more known through uh, Jewish mythology. Um, so our story starts out on the sixth day of creation. If you read Genesis 1.27, you'll notice God created man and woman. Um, so, and then, and, but then of course, then it goes on to uh, 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 create Eve or whatever a afterwards. So uh, mm -hmm. this, cr this creates a bit of a contradiction. So instead of acknowledging the fact that Genesis is a collection of multiple uh, origin stories, um, the uh, uh, Jewish scholars started uh, uh, creating myths to explain this difference. And that's when the idea of the uh, Adam having a first wife comes along. Um, and the... Uh, and... Blah, blah, blah. This is Karen. Karen. The first there, wife was a, Karen. There's an old Jewish tradition that says Lilith was actually the serpent in the garden. That oh, no that. Shit. And there's yes. some old, there's some old actually medieval depiction of the scene of the Garden of Eden where the snake, if you wish, has a snake bottom, but the top is a woman's body. Awesome. Oh, I've heard that. Okay, yeah. Okay. Awesome. That yeah. So metal. <laughs> very Medusa. Yeah, 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 very Medusa. Right? Very, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I think you ruined one of my future questions. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's fine. But, uh... You know, so, I get, I get, say, I get say, excited about Stink Woman as a turn on. So, <laughs> cool. yeah, that is pretty cool. So either way, so Adam and Lilith were both created together on the sixth day using clay and magic. God saw this was good, or saw this and said it was good, but it didn't turn out that good as Adam and Lilith did not always agree. Um, and there was soon trouble in paradise. Um, I know, celebrity marriages, they never last. Well, you know, um, what's, the first, yeah. you know what's the first thing Adam says to Lilith that we saw? Apollo? Or no. Yeah, he said, you better stand back and I don't know how big this thing gets. <laughs> <laughs> so, multiple choice. What was it Adam and Lilith could not agree on? A, missionary or cowgirl during sex. <laughs> Adam was a bossy man, baby. Uh, their marriage wasn't uh, wasn't an equal relationship. D, all of the above, or none of the above. D, D, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, that was an easy one. All of the it above. Was. Since they were both created by God and from clay, a little figured that they should uh, they should have been equals. And then, of course, Adam uh, didn't like that because he wanted to be served. <laughs> Um, and uh, in some tellings of the story, this was represented by who got to be on top during sex. In other versions, Adam was just like a bossy a-hole who wanted a subservient wife. Adam eventually tried to make Lilith uh, subservient through force and marital rape, but that didn't turn out that well and ended up being the last straw. Lilith not wanting to give up her independence or live with an abusive re in an re abusive relationship, she left Adam and the garden to go live on her own life in exile. So next, next, uh, next question. Truth, myth, or balderdash? After being raped by Adam, an enraged Lilith spoke out uh, against the sorry spoke out the magical name of uh, Jehovah and was cursed to become a demon. She was. Uh, she then went to uh, settle beside the Red Sea, since Adam was no longer after. Uh, no, lo sorry, uh, I'm having trouble concentrating. Since Adam was uh, lonely after this and kept complaining about how he how he didn't have anybody to make him sandwiches anymore, God tried to get Lilith to the return. He sent three angels to go fetch her. When they found her, she was having wild orgies with demons and giving birth to all manner of devil devils and monsters. That's oh, the Nephilim. Wow. That's where the Nephilim came from. A lot of people don't know that, but that's, uh, you know. He, he actually, oh, I'm pretty sure you're right about that. <laughs> oh, no shit. Is that a cool <laughs> I mean, It would make sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, did you just say Nephilim was a cold medicine, Kevin? Yeah, right? It's a Nephilim, you know? You put, you put, you put that with hot water. So the, oh, 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 yeah. That's awesome. So, yeah, so that is part of the myth. Although disgusted, the angels told Lilith she had to return to turn or God would uh, have drowned her in the seas. Lilith, obviously. <laughs> That's his goal for everything. 
yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, listen to me or I'll frigging kill you. Um, <laughs> Lilith obviously uh, refused. She didn't think she, that she had to return to her abusive relationship, seeing Adam as, and she also saw Adam as a lesser creature or lesser creation due to his flaws, hostility, and and uh, neediness. Uh, she refused to return uh, to a lesser man and position. Next up, truth, myth, or balderdash. Lilith was then cast into the sea, but was then saved by Satan, who took her as a wife and hid her in the bowels of hell or in the underworld to avoid God's wrath. Mm, I never heard that one. I never heard that one. Uh, I'm going to go with myth. Nah, I just made yeah, that. Yeah, nah, I just, you made it up. Nah, yeah. I was like, it's just possible. Like, it, I, I don't well, know. Yeah, that's, yeah, no, it's, it would. Uh, it, d it is possible, but uh, yeah, she actually argued that she was already far too busy taking care of the thousands of demon uh, children uh, that she had already given birth to in the hundredth, uh, the, in the hundred demons she oh, gives birth to every done. day. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know the angels ignored her. Demons, very hard. Breastfeeding demons yeah. is very, very hard. I don't recommend it. It really sucks. <laughs> um, it's, it's the teeth and the and the tails. They just get in the way. They keep whacking uh, you in the face. <laughs> um, so the angels ignored her pleas and insisted she be put to death. Lilith then argues, how dare they threaten her with death when she was doing the work of God because he asked her to take care of her offspring. As he didn't technically say the offspring had to be human. Uh, That's true. That's true. So she, yeah, so she found a loophole. Uh, she, uh, so she also reminded uh, them with her curse came the power to take the life of newborn boys up to eight days of life and newborn newborn girls up to twenty days of life. The angels okay. began to panic be and began begging Lilith to return to Eden, but eventually decided to strike a deal. So, multiple choice. Which of the following is balderdash or not true? The the concerning the deal Lilith made with the to considering the deal that Lilith made uh, was she. Oh man! Uh, so she made a deal not to to harm the infants or whatever. So which is not part of that deal? Uh, or to, sorry, I'm um, I'm kind of having an ouchy day today. So it's, that's okay. Right? That's okay. Everything's kind of blacky on me right now. <laughs> so which was so which was part of the deal? She wouldn't kill the infants if the infants wore a magic amulet with the angels' names on it. B the father who visited who was visited by Lilith in, in their sleep, aka had a nocturnal uh, ejaculation, buried an incarnation bowl under the home to uh, to show they were divorced. C the parents didn't enjoy sex during procreation, or D children were circumcised and already promised to God. Oh goodness! Oh goodness! <laughs> Which one is Balderdash? Um, hmm. hmm. I'll go with the one with the uh, nocturnal ejaculation thing. That's Balderdash. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm kind of go with that. Nope, that was true. Oh well, <laughs> no, shit. That, that, that's part of where the succubus myth comes from. Or, oh or, yeah, 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 yeah. Now I remember. Yeah. And yep. also, it's uh, and also there was like if parents en actually enjoyed sex during procreation. Who? Well, that was lustful and sinful. Uh, Lil is gonna <laughs> knock on your door. <laughs> this, I made up the circumcision. Yeah, I, I I made up the circumcision one. No, <laughs> okay. Oh shit. How? Okay, that one sounded yeah. the most true. I know. <laughs> How, yeah. but what even a with the mind yeah. trip, like you're like sex is meant to be enjoyed, which you can't really help because your body's doing what your body's doing, and then you and then you're gonna feel bad because your body's doing what it's supposed to do. Yeah, but yeah. don't worry. Okay. A, <laughs> what yeah. is it? They, they, they had I don't understand a, they, how that works. <laughs> they had a safeguard though, because like if you did have, a, uh, if the husband did have a like a, a nocturnal ejaculation, or they thought they might have enjoyed it too much, like I said, they could uh, get an incarnation bowl and bury it under the house somewhere, and that would signify that uh, Lilith, like you're divorced from Lilith, and uh, she doesn't have a right to your kids. Well, you know, so, it, it kind of sucks for women because that means that you know if that rule is true, yeah, you. you, you if you're having sex but you want to enjoy it, you can close your eyes and imagine you're having sex with Brad Pitt. That's fine. Uh, but if you're supposed to procreate, you're supposed to close your eyes and imagine who Danny DeVito or like you know John Goodman. Or, I mean, what what what's going on there? 
<laughs> well, not only that, but that what, part kind of What if you're into Danny DeVito? Like that. Oh, what if that's your have, kink? You know, then like you have why, to think why, about why Brad Pitt? Shaming? <laughs> <laughs> you have to flip it around. You have to think about Brad Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, back to the garden. Uh, Jehovah didn't like the real uh, the deal that the angels uh, made with uh, Lilith. They um, and really didn't like the fact that Lilith used a. Uh, 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 used that loophole about uh, taking care of the offspring like he commanded. Well, so uh, so he's him being omnipotent, right? And om- omnipresent, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. So he gets outsmarted by... <laughs> by, by yeah, he gets, yeah. Yeah, so you, you can probably guess why that this myth didn't catch on. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so he sent the angels back to tell Lilith she, if she didn't return to Adam, he would force her to watch 100 of her children die every day. This made Lilith, who was already bitter against Adam, also bitter against God. Even Jesus still, Christ. she. How many I don't know why. Right? What, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to kill your babies. Love me. <laughs> so, well, yeah, but 100 a day. How many kids did she have? Poor thing. <laughs> it's like, it was she, uh, it was 100 a day. It, it's uh, she gave birth to 100 days, so he was going to. So kill basically, a she's a spider. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 fucking litter, like every. <laughs> Like she's a spider. Yeah, yeah remember all their birthday too, and remember. Yeah. <laughs> I have to remember their birthday. Yeah, so the children were dying, but she's still popping out demons like a popcorn machine. So, can you uh, imagine being mad and having to yell out one name? You know, when you're mad at a kid, you say all the other names. Right? <laughs> yeah. That's what I like. You know, you know your name. Listen, like, Jim, like, uh, I mean, Jay, I mean. Gerald, jeez, which one are you? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's no. What you do, you do, you do the Finding Nemo of name, like you do one side Carl Jr. and the other half Mark Jr. And then we're done. <laughs> oh, yeah. So either way, she agreed to the fate. Uh, but not only did she keep uh, 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 keep uh, sp- sorry, um, but she did make uh, good on her uh, threat and began to kill newborns, cause miscarriages, steal babies from wet nurses, and even steal semen from men in their sleep. Uh, this is because she wanted to force the same agony she had to bear, uh, or has to bear watching on her on the offspring of Adam and Eve. Um, mm. uh-huh. So when so when does Eve come into the picture? Well, after I realized uh, Lilith wasn't coming back, he. Uh, and after he wouldn't stop whining about how lonely he was to God and how he needed a wife, uh, got, uh, after all this complaining, uh, 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 God, uh, God finally uh, decided to uh, uh, make, God, uh, make God another wife, which was Eve, Eve. But this time, instead of making the woman out of mud, he took one of Adam's ribs so that the woman was of man, uh, which would make her subservient to the man. She was a trans. Person. She was a trans woman. She was came from male DNA, but she was a woman, so she was. That, 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 yeah. That's just too <laughs> woke for uh, <laughs> for uh, Abrahamic mythology. Trying to make way stop. too much sense out of something nonsense. <laughs> yeah. You're trying no, to make sex anybody... and gender immutable, and you can't do that. <laughs> Anybody else picture Adam like you know, like like those. Like Cliff on the Christian Mingo profile, you know, says, "Yeah, I'm a good Christian man, and I want my woman to clean after me." You guys, a picture of that? <laughs> it's like, it's, Adam was right? the original yeah. incel. <laughs> like, yeah, he's he's like, Adam is current of Eden, <laughs> complaining like he can't get late because he has bad ideas about women, and God's <laughs> like, "Well, I guess so. I got to appease this mofo. Here's a wife. <laughs> <laughs> All these fucking Stacys out here." Going for the brads. That's right. I, I've been I've been pretty hard on Adam during the story, but at the same time, though, it's like I just look at the way the way the story would have been told long ago. It was to show like, oh, independent women with their own thoughts and don't want to be subservient to men. Well, they're going to turn into demonesses, and yeah. you know the way society worked back then, it, it's they were pretty much forced into situations like that if they didn't want to be subservient. So it's. Uh, so if I'm hard on Adam, it's probably because in the past men have been a little bit too hard on women. But either way, last question. Uh, truth, myth, or fo- balderdash? Uh, to take for... Oh, 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 this is the one that that uh, Kevin ruined. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I'm going to tell it anyway, so then just pretend you don't know. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> to take further revenge on Adam and his new wife, Lil took on the form of a snake and... 
and used her demonic charms to coerce Eve and Adam to into eating the forbidden fruit in order for them to expel uh, them from paradise, which obviously you know that is myth. Um, only in some versions, the, the snake in the garden is uh, is Lilith, not sat Satan. But considering uh, everything Lilith uh, was put through and not wanting to an equal marriage, um, I like I like this version better, where she kind of like tricked them into getting themselves kicked out of paradise. Um, this and also the the uh, story of where Lilith becomes a snake. Mm -hmm. um, this is reminiscent to the to uh, one of the stories of uh, Gilgamesh, where a lily or a Lilith uh, took the form of a snake, and then the branches within like a spiritual tree that uh, that he had uh, went to war or had a little conflict with. Um, but uh, either way, it's yeah, that's pretty much uh, all I have to say about Lilith. There's like tons of stuff that, uh, tons of variations of the character that, and I could probably spend like a couple episodes doing it. But uh, you, you I can tell I, like, you can tell off the bat with her story. Like she's way smarter. Her character is like way smarter than Adam and Eve. Is like yeah. Not even going to go in there. <laughs> oh, yeah. according to everybody in that story. I like. I like the idea because in in um, certain traditions, the snake is the symbol of wisdom, mm. and the fact that if she is the snake, was like, listen, I'm like, you gotta stop listening to this butthead. Yeah. <laughs> like, let me show you how things really work around here. <laughs> well, I, I like it how she uses God's orders as a loophole to disobey <laughs> God. I know and it's great. And then, and then, like, Pretty God smart. is like, oh, miss it. Oh, 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 you're like, you're supposed to know everything. And it's like, yep. oh, crap. Well, <laughs> I'll kill your baby for making me look stupid. <laughs> as, as long as you put blood on the right house. Okay. Because otherwise, I can't tell. Yeah, <laughs> right. I'll I'm an all knowing God, but you have to put the bl sheep's blood on the right house. So I can only kill the certain babies. <laughs> and, uh, snakes, a, lot of, a lot of our Christian friends don't realize also that the snake was, it never says anything in, in the Bible as the snake being Satan. It never does. No. There's <laughs> nothing at all that says it's Satan in, in the, uh, as a snake. As a matter of fact, the only reason they think that is because there's one line in Revelation that says, oh, Satan, you old serpent, or something like that. And that is it. That is that line from Revelation in the back of the book, and they went all the way to the front of the book and said, oh, well, the snake had to be Satan in the front. Said, no. Well, it, yeah. Satan, also made takes, up. Uh, Satan also takes the form of a snake and uh, and and tries to tempt Jesus also. That was Jafar. Uh, oh, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then, yeah. But, that, that, movie, that movie also uh, sexualized a 15-year-old girl in that movie. So. <laughs> Fifteen. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Brent Lee. You got another brilliant moment for my friend. Yeah, I do. <laughs> of course he does. All right. I'm so sure this, this is, is like... going to be amazing and and not problematic. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not this. I mean, sorta. Of, I don't know. I mean, violence is never not problematic. If you you know, but this is probably the funniest kind of violence I think I've ever seen from <laughs> the uh, these. Uh, <laughs> folks here and well uh, for the audio podcast like we're gonna have to explain a little bit yes because uh but oh my god this was so brilliant <laughs> and this is the type of shit that would have been at my old church like it almost looks like it you know so that's why i really caught my eye you know and uh so easter just happened just recently you know and mm -hmm. a lot of religious people get really upset about the difference um you know, the, the different uh, mascots, you know, that tend to not be as religious as they'd like them to be, uh, you know, especially like Santa Claus is a big one, even though he's a Saint Nick anyway. But the Easter Bunny is the other one that they really uh, they don't like. And so this is a pastor um, doing a visual presentation of, uh, you know, what he thinks about the Easter Bunny. So oh, no. I, you guys ever notice also there's never... All the Easter Bunny costumes are all creepy. Is that just me, or is that... no? Yeah, no, you're I, have right. picture, I have a picture of me with an Easter Bunny when I was like a little kid, and I'll, I'll have to dig it out for you guys because it's creepy. I, <laughs> I've Easter seen pictures creepy. of Easter Bunnies where I swear they use real rabbit fur. Like, how, <laughs> how does that not traumatize children? <laughs> yeah, all right. It's like um, the Donnie Darko bunnies, just like can you guys Donnie tone Dark, it down? Yeah, it's just like come on, you guys are <laughs> freaking. You're scaring the kids. Let's play that video. Here we go. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, no. 
He, he just rock bottom the Easter Bunny. <laughs> body slam. slam. <laughs> Let me tell the Easter Bunny into. Oh, come into on. The and then he walks away like triumph, and I just. All we need now is a belt. I, right? I love it. He, and he's the cool pastor. Yeah. <laughs> he was <the> cool. <laughs> pastor John comes out of nowhere with a steel chair. This <laughs> is. <laughs> Who is this supposed to impress? <laughs> oh my god, who is this supposed to impress? <laughs> well, wow, you oh, are no. so strong. Wow. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. Been, it would have been even more hilarious if the guy in the costume, because of course to do a choke sign like that, you have to push yourself off the ground and jump essentially for the guy to raise you up in the air. It would have been so funny if the guy just stood there. <laughs> <laughs> right. and he's trying to lift him up by the neck is what of course you can't do that unless you're like superhumanly strong. You just right. that. it's just it, it seems like an SNL skit. Like it looks right. like an SNL skit. It's, yeah, it's what's it to by three big men in the WWE? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What's it's going on. It just proves that, like, you know, uh, people going to church, like, numbers are down and they're yeah. doing anything they can well, to it's get like people the, in the door. There was that wrestling for Jesus thing going on where they had, like, oh, uh, God. Uh, yeah, it was a it. thing that oh, there was this church that they wanted to promote Christianity. And they also recognized that people like wrestling. So let's combine <laughs> the two. And they would, they would say like they would quote like Bible verses and preach during these wrestling matches, and then like one big guy would fight another big guy. Somebody died because of it because um, they weren't following all the safety measures that you're supposed to follow. Oh, so that was oh, another thing that yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah. but it was a thing, and I, and I think it still happens in certain circles where there's people that are wrestling for Jesus, which. I think sounds kind of sexual because have you seen wrestling? Uh, Very homoerotic. I, honestly, the wrestling Same. is the when anybody brings up the uh, whole like drag, you know, is so like over sexualizing uh, children. I'm like, what about wrestling, man? That that's just a big kink. Like, yeah. it's a big gay the, kink. The manly or the sport, the gear, the uniform. You know, you go from football and capri pants to wrestling tights to just a speedo. To yeah, the, the, the that's <laughs> clothing that happens. You know, and I'm just like, yeah. Uh, it, it all yeah. comes back. Yeah, it all comes back to the, the belief that Jesus never tapped out. But that's because he was nailed to the cross. Yeah, he was, he was nailed to the cross. My voice was right. You want to okay? So your your video, uh, it's like I'm thinking, it's like okay, does that top the craziest thing I've seen this Easter or not? Because and I don't have this on on the screen, so I got I got to go low tech and show you my iPad. But this is a this is a picture that I saw I on the internet of a oh family photo at a church. What am I looking at? <laughs> they have a guy dressed up as a beauty, uh, as a brutalized Jesus. Yeah, uh, with he's blood he's got scars and, and everything. Yeah, blood and scars. So, yeah. So, so, you know, I see a man in a dress wearing stage makeup, long hair. Uh, how How is this? A, like, it's a... Uh, and the kid, the kid looks horrified. The, yeah, kid kid has, like, what the, the kid has a totally like what the hell is the mom and daddy doing, or mom doing this? I, I just I just find it so hilarious. I, I remember seeing something very similar to the picture that Troy showed there, but it was it was instead of Jesus, it was Adam. So you got a guy just with a fig leaf, essentially, you know, with a beard and a fig leaf, and he's taking pictures and smiling with kids and kids. I was like, oh my god, completely yeah. naked. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's it's like actually impro impro inappropriate for children. It's in the Bible. It's <laughs> right? yeah. yeah, apparently, being half naked, okay around children, and um, and being like kind of cool with human sacrifice. That's cool yeah. too. That's. Yeah. Yeah, we're drag really thinking about the, the children now, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> a, a drag show is going to mess them up for life. But, like, you know, a constant bombardment with Christian gore porn, you know, that, that, that builds character. Yeah. They're, they're pretending to like, drink blood. They pretend <laughs> to drink blood. Okay? I mean, this is – they cannibalize – Anyway, all right. I, I, just, I, just, I just love at the end of Brantley's video, the guy that just choke slammed the rabbit and he walks away like, <laughs> it, was, it was the 
yes, like the fact that he's like, yeah, I'm a tough motherfucker. It's like, okay, it's like slow your roll, my man, my man. Like slow your roll. He just body okay. slammed the mascot for a, a holiday. Yeah, and uh, from from the height of that that youth pastor, he looks like he was like five foot three, five foot. He looks like a short guy too, and it's just like, oh god, it's this I is just so love, I, I just love these cool pastors. They're like wearing jeans and they get tattoos, and they're like, I'm gonna appeal to the youths. Hello, fellow yeah. kids. <laughs> like, I'm like, you can keep your Lu Lucifer's testicles, Easter Bunny basket. I'm taking you downtown, Easter Bunny. <laughs> Nothing says manly as choke slamming a rabbit. Because <laughs> Jesus Christ said so. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, you know, oh. what, are, what are the, the manliest symbol of manhood the United States? Manly, manly, manliest. You know, and when you think, I'm, I, you know, you think manly symbols of from the, coming from America, you think of like John Wayne, right? And and I'm thinking, if John Wayne was alive today and saw this, he'd be the first one to punch that bastard out. <laughs> what are you doing? I don't even like John Wayne, but even John Wayne would come in as a yeah. that hell is John, just like John Wayne. Well, was holy a cow, bigot, partner! And... I thought the snake handlers were kind of effed in the head. <laughs> Yeah. Like, I, like I don't. I'm, I'm like, what is the point of this exactly? Like, I'm like, oh, doesn't God. just eggs and chocolate and you know to fill like, the pews. I, do, I don't. I don't understand why we're attacking the Easter Bunny. Um, but I, apparently he feels like a big boy. So good for him. He feels yeah. like he's a very big, big boy. Well, you should see the, <laughs> the him, bunny. You should see the next video of him jumping from the top rope with the elbow and a tooth fairy. Oh, right, that yeah. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, that's how you get the tooth fairy's pretty small. Out, so. That's how you get the teeth out. To put it under the pillow and make your money, man. <laughs> that's that's <it>. <laughs> <laughs> Give some, even the kids the tooth fairy's teeth back to the kids you know <laughs> i can't wait to see their christmas service <laughs> oh god thank you so much Brantley. Uh, let's take a quick pause and when we come back we'll have dr del rey with us and we'll be di diving deeper into the whole incel phenomenon so stay with us all right, our, record, our returning champion is Dr. Del Rey, the psychologist in human sexuality, a snappy dresser, a snazzy dancer, and the high priest of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. Dr. Rey, welcome back to the show. Bless you, my child. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dr. Rey, it's always a pleasure to have you. You're probably one of our favorite guests. And you might not know, Dr. Del Rey, I think, is number one or number two contender as the most returned guest on this show, believe it or not. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dr. Ray, I'm, most of our audience knows you, of course, but we always have new listeners. Maybe you'd be so kind to give us a quick bio as to who Dr. Del Ray is. Well, I'm the founder and president of Recovery from Religion, which Helen is one of our top volunteers for and ambassador and, uh, and founder of the Secular Therapy Project as well. I've been a psychologist my whole life, clinical for 10 years and organizational psychologist for 30 and uh, published the book Sex and God and uh, the God Virus. Oh, and I should probably, um, yeah, I should probably put my dildo back up here, right? That's very important. <laughs> I, had a, I had another podcast I was doing uh, for a bunch of humanists and they didn't want me to have a dildo up there. <laughs> I guess humanists aren't as sex positive as you guys are. <laughs> anyway, so I, I was I, wondering where it was, but it's not my place to judge. So. <laughs> Podcasting if you don't have a dildo in the background, really. Yeah, it's, it's not a doctor. We, have an we need more dildos in, the, in our background. Oh. And uh, just to, to add uh, another thing, as I'm one of my big pet peeves right now is, uh, or pet peeves, one of my projects is uh, raising awareness for uh, for religious trauma, and uh, and trying to educate and to that end i was just on a three-week tour speaking tour of australia yeah. and uh and i've also just yes. talked in houston i'll be talking in other places about religious trauma that's kind of my push for this year educating people on what that means and you survived all the horrors of all the creatures trying to kill you in australia too. Really? yeah like not one of them succeeded thankfully <laughs> i've been to australia I mean before so i learned how to avoid them in the past Although I did saw, I did watch some uh, kangaroos boxing each other. Oh, um, nice! <laughs> yeah. No drop bears. You didn't no get drop any bears. No, no drop bears. No drop bears. 
for, for those of you in the audience that don't know what a drop bear, the Australians invented this thing called a drop bear just to annoy the tourists. And they say, well, you know, you got bears coming in the trees and just dropping on people and mauling them. Of course, it's a complete fabrication. It doesn't happen. But a lot of people have fallen for this thing. There are drop bears in Australia. And I love it. <laughs> And I should add that we are having a big fundraiser. Helen's leading the charge on that. Um, May, um, what's the date? May 6th. Helen? Okay. And uh, Ethan Michaels is uh, doing that for us as he's done for the last couple of years. So I hope people will think about going and donating to us because we want to grow and we can't grow without without funds. So thanks okay. for considering yeah, us. And like I was telling the guys, since Amazon Smile's gone away, where you can't, uh, Amazon you can't Smile, do it the lazy, because that was the lazy way to donate. Yeah. <laughs> now you have to actively do it. <laughs> and the richest, the richest man in the world can't spare a few pennies for every sale he makes on. I mean, just Jeff no, that's Bezos. just silly. Listen, he has to make another penis rocket, Daryl. <laughs> he needs another that's one. True. That's true. He's got to out. He's got to show his. his Dicks bigger than Elon Musk's, I <laughs> guess. Right. You know, I think there's an opportunity there, Daryl. I mean, I think you should call to Jeff Bezos and come in with your little dildo. They say, hey, look, look I built a market. You know, like, like a little, <laughs> little, little rocket here. And, you know, I could be a consultant on your team. I think that's you have true. Uh, <laughs> you probably wouldn't like my advice, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> the previous masculinity isn't uh, strong enough to go up in space in a pink rocket or a pink dildo rocket. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He does but, look like know, a dildo. I think, or I think the rocket should have rainbows and unicorns on it. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the thing would be taken off and you'd see every bigot in the U.S. shooting at it with their guns. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, the, the thing is now is get offended by beer cans, apparently. Yeah, that's, well, that's, that's what's going through my mind. It's like, honey, get my gun. There's a flying beer can in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get her. <laughs> There's a Bud Light beer can in the sky. <laughs> Quick, get Kid Rock. We're going to shoot this SOB. <laughs> well, oh, today we, we, we're continuing our, our exploration into the whole in-cell phenomenon. And um, we've talked a, a great length with uh, sociologists about, you know, what are in-cells and their, their effects on society and all that. But I thought, you know, the whole in-cell thing hinges on young men essentially looking for love. And I thought, who else but Dr. Del Rey could tell us about this psychology behind the sexuality maybe that these incels are facing? And I thought, you know, let's let's call in the expert and maybe you'd be so kind to get, take us through what you think is going on in the mind of these young men and why they're responding in the way they are. Okay, I'm happy to jump in here, but I want to I wanna repeat what I told you months ago when you asked me to come online you might not like what i have to say and uh, uh i'm not trying to be controversial but i do think there's some things that may come out of my mouth that sound that way so anyway just just a a warning i i don't know if that's appropriate or not anyway don't, don't worry the left is big on cancel culture so we'll just disconnect you if you go through oh, that. right. <laughs> yeah, that's right <laughs> we'll replace you with a beer can <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> I think I like you too. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let me begin by saying this is incel, incels, or what we're calling incels here is, is really a big, much bigger. It's much bigger than what I see in the news media. And it, and I think I want to approach this notion with, with a um, strong dose of, of compassion and empathy because there's a lot going on here and what's going on is not within the control of the people who are being influenced by it necess not necessarily. And what I've heard um, when people talk about incels, quote unquote, <laughs> is there's a tendency to moralize and personalize these behaviors. But I'm going to suggest that these behaviors that we're seeing, people who are basically hiding from society or going down a a very dark path from much of the rest of society, especially with respect to women, they're being influenced by much larger forces, forces that they're not aware of, obviously. And, uh, and they're, they've been, some of them been drawn into an ideology due to the stress and concerns, lack of normal exposure and socialization, for example, that, um, 
that we're seeing a lot of, of people that we would we would call incels. So um, that that's my my frameworks. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. and, any that thoughts kind of on that so far? Well, it kind no, of leads into something I was contemplating the other day is uh, like when we look at the extremism that we've seen in cells and like what what's the first thing that I remember in recent history that reminds me of this and it's like the Tea Party movement. And with the Tea Party movement, it's uh, nobody in the movement realized it, but the whole thing was like funded by the Koch brothers, uh, uh, dumping money into a movement or whatever to try to push an ideology to create dysfunction within the political system, uh, distrust in government, and then like a, a need or whatever for a, a new way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, I, I, and I don't, does that lend into what uh, your, what you're think what you're finding about incels, where it's a case where it's like, there's uh, unknown nefarious force behind it. That's uh, kind of steering people into certain directions or, well, uh, yeah, I think I think there are bigger forces, and that the, the the notion of the Tea Party force. And I live in Kansas, where the Koch brothers have had they practically own this state. So I understand what you're saying there. I just wanted to frame it in this in this way that when you see a, a big change in behavior across a wide range of people, you really should look for the roots in social and cultural changes. Mm -hmm. And 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 those and some of these changes are good some of them appear to be bad now of course good and bad can be obviously relative so i'm um we can discuss that a little bit too yeah. uh i have just um, they, i'm sorry well i was gonna say like are they even like pushing changes because like a lot of the uh stuff that we see these incels pushing is like the same old populist narratives that we see all throughout history it's it's like a like uh, tr defaming women, targeting like uh, Jewish people, uh, like uh, talking uh, like anti-government rhetoric. It, it just seems like it's the just new versions of old old subjects or whatever. It's it's not like they're. It's not like I see anything new coming from these groups. It's just new, just new, like reboots of old ideologies. But well, there's an element of that. Um... I want to kind of separate these things a little bit, though, and, and I'll explain what I mean by separate in a minute. But let's first of all define what an incel is. If you just go online and look, here's the main uh, definition that I I go by, or I think's accurate from mine. So, a member of an online community of young men who consider themselves unable to attract women sexually, typically associated with views that are hostile towards w women and men who are sexually active. So they're hostile to both men and women, Men, because men, uh, quote successful men, and at least in their mind, and women who who reject them, or who they perceive are rejecting them. So that is a pretty narrow group of people. Uh, but we have a name for them here, and you may not know it, but they've got a name for them in in Japan too, mm. and they've got a name for them in China too. And there may be a, as many as one million men in Japan that look a lot like what we're calling incels in the United States. And the name for that um, phenomena in Japan is, I'm looking it up real quick. I'm in looking back in my notes here. I, I can't remember the <laughs> specific name. I, it's, it's Japanese and I just Japanese. don't, I don't yeah, remember Kusa? Japanese no? very I'll well. I'll Japanese, Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, there, there's, there's in, in, um, in China, there's probably 20 million men that would fit the description we're talking about. And they have various names in China, one of which is lying flat, basically saying, I'm not participating in this culture or this economy anymore. I'm going to do as little as I can. In Japan, it's called Hikikomori. Hikikomori. And it's, again, there's probably a million men up to age 40 and probably older, but the phenomena is, is, is in that age range that uh, would fit what we call incels or people either, they may not be incels in the way of, of actively seeking sexual partners. They may have many, I think many in, quote incels have just given up 
And the same thing looks like has happened in Japan. And certainly in China, there, if there's 23 million extra men, and I mean that in, in a literal, literal sense, 23 million extra men in China, mm. partially as a result of their one child policy where they basically committed genocide against uh, girls, babies. It, it, I mean, it's regardless of the causes, the fact is you've got a lot of men who are pretty going to be pretty angry. And the Chinese government's pretty upset about this. In fact, they've created a whole commission to look at this phenomena. And when you read about what China's seeing and what we're seeing there, you think, well, that looks a lot like the incels. Mm -hmm. But it also mm -hmm. looks a bit like the Proud Boys and other organizations like that, because they're an angry group of people who have little chance of finding a mate or they perceive they have little chance. I mean, there's a difference there, but the statistics show <laughs> they probably do have little chance of finding a mate. And I can get back and talk about this a little bit more later, but why are we even talking about this? It's because these people show Can't up. Can't blame themselves. <laughs> yeah, they, they show up, unfortunately, as, as the majority of people who go murder shooters, for example. Mm -hmm. But these, but it's a is a sliver of our culture, because you don't hear about incels, oftentimes among minority groups. You don't hear about black incels. You don't hear about Hispanic incels. So it's a it's more a white phenomena or a majority culture phenomena, in in some ways, and I think that's the hint, in an, in and of itself. Because what you're seeing. I mentioned earlier a big transition when you see a change of behavior based you want to look for a big transition and the big transition is that the dominant male culture is being supplanted by other things mm -hmm. specifically um much more power moving into the hands of women up to a certain point it's pretty clear that the top 20 Top 10% of men are quite successful. They're quite successful in business, quite successful in marriage. And in, I mean, college educated men get married at a higher rate than anybody else. And so they're successful in finding a mate. Non-college aged men, especially pe people with no more than a high school, a high school education, they're not getting married. And their, their marriage rate is way, way down from what it was 30 years ago. And so that's, oh. the, that's the group of people that, are, that we we're calling incels or that seem to be the incels are coming from is these group of people who are not very well educated, mostly almost all men. There are women in this category too, but it's almost all men. And they are lost. They're searching for what's my role in this society. You know, 30 years ago, you could you could get a job with high school education that paid pretty well at a union steel plant, um, you know, in Ohio or something like that. Can't do that anymore. So there's a whole demographic that is lost economically and lost socially. And uh, we have to look for what's supporting the behavior, this isolation and this hopelessness, this lack of of adventure and lack of getting out to do something about it. And, and what they've done is they've gone online and they're watching a lot of pornography and they're getting into ideological groups that that talk about hating women and women are rejecting them or they can't attract women. Um, <laughs> so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy soon that, you know, if you talk about hating women enough, you're probably not what woman wants to be around a man that hates women. So it, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I, I find this very interesting because I, I think I think for most men out there, and I can certainly speak just for myself here, I think at, at some point in our youth, we were there, right? I, I, I mean, if I look at, at my life, uh, I've been very successful with women uh, throughout my life. I would consider myself very successful. Uh, but there was a point in my teenage years where, you know, I was awkward. I was, you know, I was I didn't have game or whatever you want to call it, right? And there was a, a point where I also 
question whether or not I was a catch and, you know, was looking for an answer. How, how come girls aren't looking at me? You know, how come, you know, how come, how come Derek is, 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 a, is a hit and I'm not, I mean, and I, and I could understand that, but I, I find it interesting that these, these guys, they're going into the incel that we label as incel instead of, you know, pulling themselves up by the bootstrap to use the old conservative thing, you know, just give up. I, 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 what, what, what is the reason for them to just <clears throat> drop the throw in the towel? There's, uh, well, again, remember, if there's a big change, then we should probably look for what the social uh, structure is that's causing that change. For example, um, this, and this will play right into what you just said. Men, men's, men's graduation rate from college has been plummeting. Mm -hmm. where where in 1980, 70 percent of all college graduates were men. That's down to 40 percent now. 60 percent of all women, uh, all college graduates are women. And something like 70, 75 percent of all valedictorians in high school and college are women. That is a pretty damn big change in our culture. And then if you start looking at what our species likes to do and and i mean biologically you have to look and say what are women looking for women are looking for males mates that bring resources to the relationship mates that can protect them and, and i'm talking very bi basic biology here women almost all women want a man that's taller than them that just <laughs> I, I don't care how hey, you cut the pie. That's that's true across almost all women. So you add all these things together and you realize that women want a man that's better educated than them. If women are getting more education and better education than men, that cuts the, the pool down, the quote breeding pool. If we're just looking at this like they were like humans were were, um, you know, wild wild creatures in the wild. There would be tendencies that females of a given species will choose mates based on certain characteristics. That's mm. why we've got peacocks with beautiful feathers. Mm -hmm. um, well, humans are no different. We have very strong tendencies as a, as a culture, as a um, biological tendencies that are, that push men and women into making choices. These are totally unconscious, but, but there's pretty, pretty common is how, how many couples do you know where the man is shorter than the woman? I know one, I can name one right now mm -hmm. of all my friends. I know two. <laughs> two. Yeah. Okay. I know all my friends. I know two. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so it happens, but it's pretty uncommon. Now, how many couples do you know where the man has less education than the woman? Probably about the same amount. Mm -hmm. So what happens when a man when a man can't find a mate because he's because all the women around him want somebody that's better educated, that's getting that can be very discouraging. And some of that is what we're seeing here. We have to start asking questions about what what's causing this shift. For example, we all agree it's damn good that women are now getting the education that they they deserved all along. Mm -hmm. I mean, Madame Curie was such a success and exception to everything about women in her day, but why couldn't there have been a hundred thousand Madame Curies in 1910? Yeah. Uh, you know, the only reason was because we had a patriarchy that was, that was holding women back and preventing women from even getting degrees. I mean, she, she probably had to go on the coattails of her husband to get a Nobel prize. So I think we can all agree that there were enormous pressures against women and those, the beautiful thing about today is those pressures have been released. And so women are now able to go do whatever the fuck they want to do. Well, but nobody's asking the question, what is the, are there any consequences to that? When you, Title IX was passed in 1974, it gave women a lot more opportunities to things like sports. Uh, you know, you can't discriminate based on, on gender. So that's, that's good. We all agree to that. But what happens when, and this is where the real crux hits. What happens when men have been told their whole lives 
and for centuries, here is your role. Here's what you have to do. Here's what's manly. You can't, nursing is not a manly, nursing is not a manly uh, profession. So we have a shortage of nurses right now, but we've got a million men sitting in their mother's basements that could have gotten nursing degrees and moved into nursing. Why not? Because nursing is not a manly. And how many, how many decades have we been told as, as male, I'm a male, these are manly professions. These are not manly professions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you've got women now moving into manly professions. Mm -hmm. Here's an interesting story that came to me about two months ago. Um, a woman took her, a woman took her daughter to the doctor. And when they came back, the, the woman's da um, daughter was playing with her son. And they were playing doctor. Now, it's a pretty normal thing for five, six, seven-year-old kids to do. So they're playing doctor. And the girl is playing the doctor and the boy's playing the patient. After a while, the boy gets tired of this. and says, I want to play doctor. And the girl says, boys can't be doctors. Oh. The mother overheard this. The girl <laughs> said, boys can't be doctors. And the mother, and this woman's a PhD psychologist that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. The woman thought and she realized that every medical professional that her daughter had ever seen was a female. Mm -hmm. Right now, virtually 70% of all graduates from medical school are female. When I was growing up, I never knew a female doctor. I've had the last last 25 years of my life, I've had a female doctor, but I didn't grow up with female doctor. Every doctor that mm -hmm. I grew up with was a male. Can you see how huge a shift that is? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that's gigantic. And it's wonderful for women. But what does it do for men? Because all those jobs that men would have been taking in medical school are gone to them. So where do they go? Are they going to go into nursing? No, they can't do that because that's, quote, not a manly job. But there's other things. For example, when I was growing up and, and later, there were quite a few more men in elementary school as teachers. Today, you can't you can go from elementary school to elementary school and never find a man. It may be maybe a man that's a janitor. Maybe the man might be the principal. Probably not. You, you cannot find men in elementary school, period. So if you think about it this way, all those boys in that, you know, all those girls in that elementary school are surrounded by damn good female models role models that are also saying you can go be a doctor you can go be an engineer the boys in that same school are surrounded by female models and we know that boys thrive when they have male models around mm -hmm. boys don't thrive when they have female models around female models don't seem to translate into male male things and and females in the elementary school tend to treat boys the same way they treat girls. They want the boys to shut up, sit down and learn their lessons. Mm -hmm. Boys. And here's something I want to throw out here. This could be controversial. We've heard this. We've heard the saying boys will be boys. Uh, -uh. boys will be humans. We have to, we are not treating boys like the humans. They are mm -hmm. boys in elementary school need a lot of exercise. They need to get out and roughhouse. They need to fight with each other. I mean, there's that's the way boys socialize. And yet our culture is saying boys should not be doing that, which is bullshit. That's not the way the boy's brain works. It's not the way his body works. So what happens when these boys have gone through this entire um, early life pattern through elementary school, even into junior high, when they're overwhelmed by female models and there's no males around to teach them how to be men how to be mm -hmm. boys how to treat women and at the end of this you're going to have a slice you know a slice of those boys who simply are never going to be able to make it in society and by the way many of them are neurodivergent as well and and that school system has not uh, allowed for neurodivergence among boys and it punishes boys for simply being boys in, in many cases. 
Anyway, I'm, I'm preaching I, here. I'm saying I, I can't well, recall what neurodivergence some, means. There is some truth to that because my son is, um, he's 19 now, but when he was younger, had um, um, sensory integration dysfunction and ADHD. And the only way that we, they found over time to get him to concentrate was for him to have a release of physical energy. So he would have to go to like a gym room before school and get that extra energy out. And then during lunchtime, he would go back to that room to do a physical activity. So he was able to concentrate in class. And yep. he still, and like, I have ADHD, so I told. I'm like, this is what you got. Think like, here's just some genetics. You're neurodivergent now. Um, but if you don't have that empathy and idea that boys are different, how they're also how the, those neurodivergencies will trust themselves versus men versus women, because it will shove differently in boys and girls, just because of the way our, our brains and hormones are and things like that. If you're not aware of it and you're trying to, again, trying to put it like a square peg into a round hole and saying, this is how it's supposed to fit. It, you're going to have, you know, boys feeling like, well, this is the standard you've set up. How am I supposed to fit into it? Yeah, they can't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Helen, I'm glad you mentioned that because I have two grandsons. I had a son who was neuro neurodivergent as well. My two grandsons probably aren't neurodivergent, but they are high, high energy. I mean, I got a grandson that's training this month with the U.S. Olympic team in in Colorado Springs. I, I will brag a little bit. He's on he, he's training. He's 17 years old. He's a national champion um, in wrestling, in Greco Roman wrestling. But this kid has had high energy from the day he was born. And thankfully, his mother and his grandmother, my ex-wife, have made sure this kid gets all the exercise he can get. Mm -hmm. And and he will come back to school. He, he does decent in grades. But if you try to force this kid to sit still for hour after hour, you're you're doing real damage to this kid. And that's true of a lot of kids, a lot of boys especially. Mm -hmm. Now, I think we've done a great job of of changing our culture so that women get the fair shake they deserve. I think we can hold two thoughts in our head at the same time. Number one, it's great that women continue to show progress, get more power than society, and we need to get rid of the patriarchal. I think we can hold that, that thought in our head. And then the other side, we can say, but boys need help too. Because mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you something. Every major religion tells men and women what their role is. Current culture totally contradicts the teachings of these religions right now. In addition, thousands of years of literature and tradition and movies and pop culture are still telling men and women who they are and how they should behave. These all contrast with the reality on the ground. I mean, think about, can you read Shakespeare without being taught what manly men look like? Mm -hmm. Can you read the Bible without being taught that women are second class citizens? Now, we have half of our population has gotten beyond that or, or looks like they're getting beyond it. The women in our culture have learned to not take that shit anymore and they're not believing it. But I'll tell you the lessons of who and what you should be from the literature and the religion and the pop culture are still there and men are still absorbing them. I mean, think of every pop song. How many pop songs are there out there that reinforce gender roles in very rigid ways? It's 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 on every radio station. Mm -hmm. Or the sexualize or the continued sexualization of women. It's yeah, it's like uh, everywhere in music. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and men are being taught that men are not just being taught. <laughs> but they're also seeing it in many ways that if you don't have a quote trophy wife, then you're a loser in life. Mm -hmm. I mean, Donald Trump talks this way. Yeah. Uh, and he is Melania Trump over here who, pro who probably hates his guts. <laughs> I would imagine. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So men are being taught to only look at, at women one dimensionally. And that is according to whatever beauty standard is present in the culture at that time, because 
Oh, by the way, beauty standards change a lot and they could change very fast as well. But right now our boys are being taught there's a certain standard. If you don't, if you can't find a mate that meets that standard, then you're a loser. So, so what it means is these boys that are now going the incel route are saying, I can't find a woman that meets this standard over here. Even though there's 80% of the women are still left. They just write the other 80% off because they don't meet some, some crazy standard that's being forced into them by, by their culture. And if you don't believe me, listen to the way boys talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Listen to the way men talk to each other about, you know, their, their quote, trophy wives. And we got to, we even have a term trophy wife. It is it a trophy wife is a statement about a man's value in the world. And incels are seeing that. And so they're cutting off 80% of the possible mates. And then they're complaining that women reject them. Well, you haven't, you haven't even tried to treat women like real human beings, for one. And the reason you haven't is because you were never socialized to do that. If I can I, add another dynamic to that, yeah. it's a, uh, like we've all grown up here uh, watching Disney with fairy tale endings where like uh, people just uh, find each other, magically fall in love and, and hit it off. And love is instantaneous and around every corner. Happily ever um, yeah. Meanwhile, there's me. I'm like, Kevin, I was never really that much of a player. <laughs> it's a, yeah, uh, <laughs> for, uh, but you know, I was still, I was still able to find a mate, but it took years to find somebody that I was compatible with uh, that uh, appreciated me as much as I could appreciate them. And it's a, yeah. Uh, and I just look at the fact that it's like, is part of the problem here that, uh, uh, we have we're in a society of instant gratification where we think that uh, I want to fall in love. So so uh, you know I, I should be able to go to the bar and find someone that's perfect for me, or or go over here and find someone perfect for me, and just not willing to wait or put the work into finding a relationship or making a relationship work. Or that's a good like, question. That's yeah. Put put that in. in. Ten words, if you will. I want to. I'm not sure I got it all. <laughs> or, or give give the question. I mean, in, in a more okay. specific way. I'm not it's sure. It's gratification all. a problem <laughs> in this society because of that. Yeah, it, it's uh, yeah. If I could reword it, it's uh, p uh, guys because of media influences like you're talking about. Um, guy, are guys expecting to find true love to find the perfect mate like instantaneously? And not realizing that you have uh, love takes time. Like there's plenty of fish in the sea, but you have to be patient to find the right fish, and then at the same time put in the work uh, into that relationship to uh, to to make it work. Because it's I'm not an attractive guy, but you know it's I'm, I'm in I I'm in a loving relationship, and it, it uh, and that transcends be beyond. Man, that's way more than ten words. <laughs> but it's like, but you know that that transcends beyond like, uh, oh, I'm supposed to have a trophy wife, or I'm or my wife's supposed to be a certain way. It, it, it's a case like, it's it's like an old saying. It's like for and I'm going to get myself in trouble here, but an old saying I used to hear: for every pretty girl you see, there's some guy tired of screwing her. And extremely sexist uh, statement, but you know, at its core, it's a case where it's like if there isn't a foundation to a relationship, then relationships aren't going to work. And it's a, uh, if people are looking for superficial aspects in, in a mate, then they're, they're going to come up dry no matter what. It, it, it's so that's, that's kind of like where I'm pushing back at it is the, uh, it, it's a, uh, is the problem with the fact that men are having to change the roles in society or the fact that, that men are expected now expected to put more work into a relationship that they're just not willing to give. Well, I think that may personalize it in, in a way. In, in, in a, let me address this in this in this way. Why what would cause men to not understand this requirement of putting work into a relationship? something something happened that did not educate them for i'll just give you a personal example when i was growing up my mother 
had four boys. Now she inadvertently taught us this. I don't think she wasn't a feminist. She didn't know what she was doing, but she basically told the four boys, look, you guys may not find a woman to take care of you. So you're going to have to learn how to keep house. You have to learn how to do this. You have to learn how to shop and you have to learn how to manage money. And, and my mom pushed that on us. Now, I look back and realize it's because she didn't like doing housework. <laughs> she didn't like picking up after all the all us I feel, boys. I feel your mom. I feel her. <laughs> but it your had mom sounds it, like a lot like my mom. <laughs> it, it had the effect of teaching us it, all, all four of my brothers. I mean, I've got four, four, three brothers, four of us. We all we are not afraid of doing housework. And we know how to treat women, even though we didn't have any women in my house except my mother. But my mother t knew knew how to teach us how to respect women. Uh, it was it was an education, but it was an education that boys are not getting right now, yeah. for for a number of reasons. But um, I think we have to ask, what are the reasons? I got that education, but what is the end cell not getting? And I think there there's probably many reasons for it. I, I think I think you're onto something, Troy. I'm not I'm not saying you're not. I just I want to look at the root. I like root, looking at root causes. I want to. I want to get back to a couple, a few statistics that mm -hmm. I think play play into this because I think boys and men are lost. Not all of them by a long shot, but many boys and men are just lost. They don't. They have never been properly socialized. They've never been properly educated. They've been treated um, in a way at elementary school that we've already talked about in a way that probably undermined their confidence or ability to to learn as we talked about with Helen's uh, and my grandkids. So it means that because, because of that, boys are not, a, a, a slice of boys are not able to form normal bonds with other, other people, not just women, but other people. And my example of this is a survey of, a, a Pew survey of men in 1990 found that 55% of men had six or more close friends. In 2021, the same survey showed that only 27% of men had six or more close friends. That is an enormous change. In 1990, 3% of men had no friends, no close friends. In 2021, 15% of men Whoa. surveyed had no friends. So what, that's what I mean. What is going on? That, it's not that they have, they don't have any friends, but they also means they don't have any female friends. So they're not just not able to have relationships with women. They aren't having relationship with the men either. Hmm. That's a pretty big change in the society. That's what I mean by when you see a big change in society, let's ask what's going on. Boys, there's what we've seen is increased level of depression in boys in the last 20 years or so. And yet we know that we as human beings are happiest when we're in motion and we're surrounded by other people. We're, I can't, that's why recess was so important to me when I was in fifth grade. I could yep. not wait to get outside so I could play kickball with my friends and wrestle with them a little bit and mm. run around. And I'm surrounded by other kids experiencing the same thing. Many, many elementary schools have cut recess out or, or they've limited what boys can do during recess. And it's, it's crazy. It's going so against the grain of male yeah. human. Well, that's one of the complaints I have with my daughter's schools. Like I remember lunch hour at school where it's like you, you got to eat and then you had enough time to play like a full game of soccer or baseball yeah. or whatever was out in the field. Now it, it's uh, they, they have like five to 10 minutes to eat in the classroom. And then they're sent outside for like 20, 30 minutes. It's like, that's what our recess used to be. Yeah. It, it, so it, it's a, uh, and for me, I, I'm like you, it's like, I see that as an important part of growing up because kids need to be able to learn how to interact with other kids outside of a structured environment, like a classroom. Because yeah. it, it, it's the, it's that interaction that helps them discover who they are, how they interact with other people, and it's uh, and it seems like the, that's one thing where I see the education system is fail, failing. Is they're expecting kids to be able to do that out, outside of school, but outside of school they're usually on a tablet or at home or 
because uh, parents are too busy to drive taxi kits all over the country anymore. So or I'm going to add to that, Troy. Um, when I was growing up, uh, we had intramural sports. So the school always did different sports. Every so, so much of the block school year did different sports. Now with my, my three daughters, they, they don't get sports unless you add to a team outside of the school. Like they, they mm. almost took away the intramural oh. sports. It took away phys ed all the time too. Yeah, and phys ed as well. So to me, that's where the interaction as well became. And they learned to be a team and learn to meet new people and, and be friends with other people. Right. Yeah. And they learn, they learn how to deal with conflict. They learn how to compromise. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen in team play and mm -hmm. I, and i'm not pushing sports ball <laughs> i'm a big fan of <laughs> well it's ball, not right? even just uh team play like if, I don't you, do if you're not playing sports yeah if you're not playing sports during noon hour though you're still like interacting with other uh, with other kids like yeah, just some around. kids would play D, &D right, at right. lunchtime or some or some kids would uh have, have like chess club or or like you would have all these uh, uh, social uh, social groups, whatever, during noon hour. Not everybody were jocks and, and playing sports. But again, it's like that extra club activity seems to be uh, removed from our society. Right, in right. So and again, there's going to be that slice of mostly men that are just, they need that. And the fact that they're not getting it is going to put them at a huge disadvantage later in their life. And, and here's the kind of disadvantage I'm talking about. I'll throw another statistic at you. In early teens, male and female suicide rates are about the same. By age 26, boys, men's suicide rate is six times higher than women's. Oh, wow. Six yeah. times. And this is a consistent pattern we've seen for a decade or so. So, again, it's a big change or a big piece of our culture. What, what is causing this? And we we can per, we can't personalize this and say, well, it's because this person's morally, in you know, incompetent or something. It, there's something else going on, and I yeah. think we're I think our discussion today is hitting on some of this. Our educational system is not meeting the needs of boys. Yeah. Period. Doctor Ray, I got I got to ask you another question about uh, about this because we we can, we can all agree that the barriers or the glass ceiling being shattered for women is a good thing. We can all agree that, and we can also agree that the answer that is provided uh, for for getting rid of incels from the, the conservative right, which is returning back to the 1950s, is a bad idea. We can all agree that. But I think what uh, what I seem to note uh, is uh, it seems to me a lot of these incels people are really are not against the idea of women having equal rights. They're, they're really against the idea of women having what they would call a privilege. Like, for example, when you, you're getting, you know, uh, school programs that are trying to bring in more diversity, or school programs that are to bring more women into the, the in, to equalize the numbers, if you wish. Is it? Would it be a solution for us to say, or oh, we're removing the barrier for women, for example, to uh, the barriers, the historic barriers they had in the past, but not implement a program that, for lack of a better word, um, benefits them into the application of things. I'm talking like for a school, for example. You know, you say, yeah, of course, women have every right, as, as, as many rights as guys to come in and get a PhD to become a doctor, but we're not going to favor 60% women and 40% men. Would that, be, would that be a solution to maybe eradicate the whole incel problem? Uh, no, I, I don't think that would address, uh, address the bigger problem. Because the bigger problem started back in fifth grade, in kindergarten. I mean, there's how, how we that formative time for the for the male brain is not being respected by our mm -hmm. educational system. Mm -hmm. So I don't care what you do at the PhD level uh, if, if if you've if the brain has been disrespected and not, and I mean by that I mean if we're not paying attention to the natural biological developmental process of boys as it is different from girls then we're disrespecting that and that's going to last a lifetime 
Yeah. Wow. If we can fast forward beyond that, and you touched on this earlier, the uh, there's like also media indo indoctrination. So like you're talking about high suicide late, uh, rates among men uh, later in age. It, it's uh, you know once guys have reached that age, they've spent their entire life watching movies where the guys like a Her Herculean figure, or <laughs> or 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 you know some brilliant strategist, or like you know it, it, it's a uh, they spend their entire life seeing men portrayed as heroes in the cinema and on television and everything else. And then all of a sudden it's like, they're going to start reflecting on their own life. And it's the case where it's like, well, that's not me. It, it, and you know, that, and that's, and that's gotta get uh, cause like a lot of people to just, like, just like really beat themselves up and allow them to buy into uh, what some of these incels are selling them. Or, or am I off off key with that? Or well, yeah, so people are men in this case are are feeling like there's no place for me in this planet, and mm -hmm. so they become more and more depressed. It's we more and more suicidal, and they've they they didn't have the skills to live in this new environment anyway, because this new environment requires a higher level of socialization of men. Women women already have that socialization, but men are not getting that. Um, at least, yeah. Well, many. my generation, my generation, for example, though, like we're the MTV generation, we were raised on television. We're getting our morals from how television, cinema, and everything else portrays the world. Yeah. But in reality, is the world is not ref does not reflect what we see on television and in movies. And well, if you you look at those movies and television, it goes back to this notion that. Men are being told, you know, you're a loser if you don't have this kind of a mate. Women are getting the same message from those movies. You know, if you're, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you don't, very rarely do you see a movie about uh, an, a college educated woman uh, getting the getting the guy who has an eighth grade education. You know, that just doesn't, doesn't work that way usually. So women are looking for something over here. If you go to the dating apps, there's been some really research, interesting research on dating apps. And if, you know, you swipe right or swipe left, um, I, I'm not on Tinder or any of those things. I don't know. But um, I have done my share of Internet dating, but it was a few years back. Um, if you look at who are women looking for, women are, when they're on the dating apps, they're looking for men who appear to have the ability to bring resources. So that's only the top 10 or 15 percent of the men that are on that app. What are men looking for? Men are on the same app and they're looking for women that are in the top 10 to 15 percent of looks. <laughs> that, that is not a good equation because you got all these people that could be really good mates, but they're they're missing each other. You know, they're just going women are going up here and men are going up there and all the other people are being missed. Oh, and then mm -hmm. you got. Um, what seventy percent of all the people on the apps are men, uh, so and only thirty percent are women. But I think also too, like when we're talking about like you know um, sexual viability, you know, in a marketplace, you know, we're going to use it, look, we're going to use it, economic, we're going to use it economy, you know, language to explain this. Yeah. Our, our assessment of worth of a human being is how much we recognize the other human being in the other person, you know, that they have this ability to think for themselves and make their own choices and things like that. But if, if your, your messaging is the only way I can be a viable person, if I have dominance in a certain degree over somebody else, because you see it like, you know, this is why like feminist discussions can be so fraught because we need to have an idea of suppression to talk about the issues that we're facing when really it's like, no, because when we start pushing ourselves above other people, other people will get left behind and we're not having those discussions about their vulnerability and right. falling through the cracks. Because if, you know, we're all trying to get to this dominance place, you know, with, with collateral, with like how we propagate our species and all this type of bullshit, it causes problems in the line because somebody will always get left behind. Someone will always be harmed and feel isolated and they'll fall into ideologies yeah. that make them feel powerful. 
Uh, oh, that is, I think that's a great analysis, Helen. It, it, it literally gives people an opening to get attracted or sucked into ideologies. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's what's happened here with this slice of men that we call, we're calling incels is they're getting sucked into ideology, but it also includes proud boys and, you know, some of the other very, well, very, well, proud, very, proud elite. boys started out, started out pretty much the same way. Like I, I remember when like, <sighs> proud boys was like still, still in development or whatever. And, uh, and I got, and I was approached by them. Uh, like uh, online and it was pretty much the same thing that you see from incels is like uh, uh men men are short changed women are superficial the uh no uh you know they're not gonna like you because of who you are rather how you look and you know if you're if you're single at the time uh, which i was it, it's like uh you really gotta put serious thought into whether or not you want to take this rhetoric seriously or or how ref or like whether it actually reflects real reflects reality uh, because at the end of the day you can either realize that your relationship status is on you uh, and you alone like if you're going to put yourself out there you have to put out your best qualities you have to be respectful you got to be someone that people want to have a relationship with um, and if you're not willing to do that, you're not going to be able to find a mate. But but these incels and like the Proud Boys at the time, it was, it was like, it's not your fault. It's not you. It's them. And it's uh, and it just seems like that, uh, like for a lot of people, it's like, oh, what a what a relief. It, it's, uh, it's, it's not me after all. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a rhetoric that's becoming very interesting for all these grifter organizations out there. And I'm even talking about religion here because this is what we're seeing. We're seeing all these religious organizations also going after these incels because, you know, they're, they're vulnerable. You know, they feel they, they feel they need to belong somewhere. And all of a sudden you have all these groups that talk about, you know, oh, well, you're an incel, but that's fine because anyway, you shouldn't be masturbating, blah, blah, blah. And you know, you're just, <laughs> yeah. You're just yeah. Right? Well, well just because look at the you're current... generals, you know, bad things, bad things. <laughs> yeah. Country oh, generals, no. bad things. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what those are, but they're they bad things. Pure, but that's okay because you should remain pure anyway for the <laughs> Lord and, and stuff like that. And, and some of these incel people are falling for this, right? So that yeah. becomes but like If you look at what like religion sells nowadays, it's like religion used to be about faith, works, and deeds and stuff. Now it's religions just about faith. You don't have to be a good person. Yeah, just need to show up to church, uh, uh, worship, and uh, to the and collection. say and say you're sorry, and voila, you're a new person. And if anybody doesn't want to accept you as being a child of God, then that's not that's their fault, not yours. And it's like it's almost like the same message where where you don't have to take res personal responsibility uh, when you can just ask for forgiveness. Uh, where with incels, you don't have to take personal responsibility. You can just point the finger at somebody else. But. Dr. Ray, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. We've, oh, you've been we very already? already? We've been, <laughs> been very generous with your time, sir. I really appreciate that. Um, in, in conclusion, I guess, maybe a quick uh, uh, a quick finish. as uh, For people that are listening out there, and we, we've, we've talked about incel, but we seem to have really focused on you know, early education for young uh, for young boys. Uh, what would you recommend the, the layperson does to try to improve the situation? Oh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> uh, Is there I, an app for that? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I do have some ideas, and thanks for asking. I'm glad I've got a little time to talk about that. First of all, there there is some good evidence that parents might want to consider, and I'm seeing seriously consider, putting their boy children in school a year later. Because number one, make sure boys are ready to go to school. Many boys, um, and dad is pretty solid on this for decades, many boys need more time to get ready to be able to settle down and, and do what they need to do in school. Second is do what Helen did, get boys your boy children, more activity time during the school day if possible, because it's not enough to have them go out and play baseball or football or just wrestle or whatever they want to do after school. They need a release during school so they can come back in and settle down. Um, so that would be a second recommendation. 
A third recommendation we didn't get to talk about much, and that is get more male teachers in elementary school. Mm -hmm. We have seen a decline in male teachers in elementary school. And here's one of the reasons I think why. And this is a this is a really serious issue. All men are predators. Mm -hmm. I hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, if all if a recent survey asked parents, what would you accept a man as your third grade kids teacher? Most of the parents said, no, I would take my child out of that room. Wow. OK, that's interesting, isn't it? And it comes from this myth that we, we have seen perpetrated in recent times that all men are predators. And the, the highlighting of this is is horrendous because it means our children are being denied an, an important model in our society. And that is male models, male teacher models. Mm -hmm. um, fourth is I would encourage people to start looking at, quote, non-male. I'm seeing I have seen personally an increase in in male nurses. I mean, it used to be a big thing. He's a male nurse, the only one in the whole hospital. But now we're seeing more men moving into, mm -hmm. quote, nursing. That's a good thing. Why can't we do that more with, with teaching? We have seen a drop in male teachers, not just in elementary schools, but everywhere else. So that would be another recommendation. Change the damn educational system to be to let boys be human. And that we've we've talked about that already. And uh, begin. Here's something we didn't get to talk about. We'll talk about another time. We need gender liberation here. We need to stop pushing gender roles, whether it's subconsciously or consciously on children. Let children develop their own gender identity in a way that uh, fits their needs. There may be some girls, for example, that need a lot more physical education. Then let them do it. Some boys might not need it at all. They, some, you know, I'm preaching to the choir, I know. Mm -hmm. But just those, those would be some of my recommendations. I, I could go on, but we're we're out of time i know <laughs> let boys be human and you'll have fewer incels wow that's, that's wow my... let pe let people be human <laughs> yeah wow. I mean... that's the simplest <laughs> answer ever <laughs> dr Delray, thank you so much for being with us today you're it's welcome. always a Thanks, pleasure kevin as per usual i got to have you say hi this is dr delray and i took a left of the valley hi this is dr daryl ray and i took a left at the valley and on his left, a dildo. Proud to be an atheist, a skeptic, a non-believer, an infidel, a heathen. I call it how I see it. I say it's ignorance, and you just call it faith and unsubstantiated claims. That's something to be ashamed. I'm an atheist.